there are, in general, two broad categories for methods for setting, st cutting scores or passing scores on high-stakes tests. When you have a set of uh, examinees that are taking a high-stakes test, the methods can either focus on the examinees or on the test. So those are the two broad categories. We're looking at the examinees. There are two methods that are often used for setting passing scores on high-stakes tests. One of the methods is to have somebody, an external person, who knows the examinees to classify them without any knowledge of how they would do on the test into whether they deserve to pass or whether they th these external people would classify them as not having the competencies to pass. And then, after the candidates have taken the test, they look at the test scores of those uh, candidates who, in, it, in advance, were expected to pass or were expected to fail. And they use a mathematical strategy, typically logistical regression, to find the score that best differentiates the passing candidates from the non-passing candidates. So that's one of the methods uh, in the category of examinee-based. The other method is one that is based on a norm, normal curve theory where the examinees are expected to perform in a bell-shaped curve and the passing score is set, for example, one standard deviation above the mean, which would typically pass around 15% of the candidates, or one standard deviation below the mean, which would then only pass about, uh, fail about 15% of the candidates. Now these methods, although they have been used when, in high stakes testing, have some serious problems. The first method, Often in high stakes testing, there's not any person that knows the candidates in advance well enough to classify them into passing, likely passing, and likely not passing. So that's a problem if you want to use that in a high stakes environment. Using the normal curve model is really not a competency based approach. And in the states, there's been legal challenges when a passing score on a high stakes test has been based on this normal curve theory. So although they're used, it wouldn't be my recommendation to use the examinee-based approach. Now on the test-based approach, those are using the specific items that are in the test. And I'm gonna talk specifically about tests that are comprised of multiple choice items, because I understand in the NSA, for example, all of the high stakes tests are based exclusively on multiple choice tests. There are two methods that I want to talk about. One of the methods is called the ANGOFF, A-N-G-O-F-F -F method. In this method, a panel is brought together. Often that panel is uh, tailored to represent broadly the content domain. And these content area experts are called subject matter S experts or SMEs. They're brought together and trained on this method. The method entails having the panel talk about the competencies of the candidates that are just at the passing mark. So it's very competency-based. And then they look at each and every item in the test and they predict what percent or the probability of a randomly selected, minimally competent candidate would get the item right. And they do that for each and every item in the test. So if there are 100 items in the test that have to make 100 different estimates and each member of the panel makes these estimates independently. And then for each individual panelist, we add together their estimates across the 100 items and that generates their estimate of the passing score. If we have 20 people on the panel, we average across the 20 and we get the panel's estimate. This 
method usually involves multiple rounds. So I just talked about the first round. After the first round, usually some information is presented to the panel. Then would be told what is the average passing score for the panel and what are the individual panelists recommended passing scores. If they're really spread out, then there isn't much cohesion or consistency in the view of the panel. So often the panel will be given information about what the other panelists think. Sometimes they'll be given information about how candidates actually perform on the test, like the proportion of, of candidates that got the item right. Is it an easy item or a hard item? Uh, sometimes they get impact data, so what percent of the candidates would actually pass if we use this passing score? And with that information, they get an opportunity to go back and for each and every item in the test, revise their estimate of the probability that a randomly selected, minimally competent candidate would get the item right. This can iterate multiple rounds. Often it's either two or three rounds with different kinds of information provided between rounds. The other method that I want to talk about is called the bookmark method. In the bookmark method, the calibrations of the items in advance are used to prepare what's called an ordered item booklet. And the ordered item booklet is sequenced one item per page with the easiest item shown first and then sequentially by difficulty the most difficult item shown last. So if there were 100 items in the test, you'd have a 100 item ordered item booklet. Again, we bring in a panel of subject matter experts and they go through this training talking about the competencies of the person who's minimally competent to pass. And once they have an understanding of those minimum competencies, then each panelist has a bookmark. That's why they call it the bookmark, bookmark method. And they go through the booklet page by page and they say, would a minimally competent candidate likely get this item right? And often likely is two-thirds of the time, or would two-thirds of the minimally competent candidates get this item right? And they say, sure, yes, yes. And then eventually they get to a place in the booklet where they say, I don't think so. I think this is the boundary between p this candidate being able to get it right and not being able to get it right. So they put their bookmark there. All of the panelists do this independently. Now we have these items are calibrated so we know the B values in the item response theory metric for those items. And so we average the B values for the item that they think the candidate would get right and the one they think they won't get right to get an a indication of that panelist's cut score. And that's then transferred onto the theta scale to, to get the cut score. Again, each of the panelists will have their own theta cut based on where they put the bookmark. Um, and often it goes through several rounds. So after they've done it once, they get feedback about what are the other panelists' cut scores look like, what, uh, would, what would the passing rate be, that kind of information. And, and they will do multiple rounds. So I've talked now about two different approaches one based on the examinees and using how the examinees are either pre-classified and how they perform on the test or using the norm, normal curve. Those are the examinee-based methods. And then I talked about the test-based methods, specifically for multiple choice, the Angoff method, and the bookmark method. That was certainly the goal, was to pay attention to and in particular draw attention to gaps in performance by different categories of examinees. Um, I believe that it has improved learning, it has focused on outcomes, but on the other hand it's had some pretty serious negative consequences. So on average overall I'd say yes it's a positive but it's not 
a universal positive because it's been used by policymakers to make some decisions that are um, beyond what I think the attests were intended to measure.